Hey, I'm Laurie Santos. I'm a professor of psychology at Yale University and host of the Happiness Lab podcast. So I first heard about your research because you had done this study that now I'm really going to oversimplify it and I want you to fix it. But that was basically like having monkeys build a an economy based on different types of fruit. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good description, actually. Okay, um, okay. And so we wanted to see one of whether or not some of the standard economic biases that humans showed were shared with monkeys, too. Um, and so we taught monkeys how to use a kind of form of currency, these little metal tokens that they traded with humans for food. And that mean, meant that we could put monkeys into kind of really simple economic experiments, really ask them their preferences about things like, you know, risk um, and, like, whether or not they paid attention to how much food they were getting and so on. And what we found was that the monkeys were pretty rational in all the spots that humans were rational, but they also showed all the same irrational biases that humans tended to show. They were they overpaid attention to risk, and they kind of were, had this tendency to frame what they were getting in terms of gains and losses, which is the kind of thing that leads humans astray. And one of the big things from this study that has just kind of always stuck in my head is that uh, there were a lot of monkeys who were totally happy with the fruit that they were getting until they saw that a different monkey was getting more fruit or better fruit. And then all of a sudden they became furious and didn't like the things that had made them happy just moments before. Yeah, I mean, this, this was actually some lovely work by Sarah Brosnan, who used really similar kinds of studies with, with her group of monkeys. And it's an, yet another bias that we tend to show, right, which is that we tend to socially compare ourselves with others. So even if what we're getting is perfectly fine, as, as soon as we see that somebody else is getting something that's better than we're getting, all of a sudden we're unhappy with it. And and this has a really strong connection to happiness and, and subjective well-being, right, because I think so many of us, you know, objectively are, are doing quite well. We've got a roof over our head, you know, food on the table and so on. But we're so prone to be seeing what's going on with other people. And it can really negatively affect our happiness, even when in cases when we're objectively doing really well. Is that part of the bridge of what got you into human happiness? I wonder if if seeing how animals, how it's kind of hardwired into many of us to, to have these things that make us unhappy that we wish we could overcome was was part of the seed of what brought you into happiness in the first place. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, one one of the reasons I was always so fascinated with work in monkeys is 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 because a lot of times we we get focused on, oh, humans, we do things, you know, so amazingly well. We have all this technology and language and this amazing culture. We're so different than other animals. But when I looked at humans, what what I saw generally was, yeah, you know, we're we're doing great, you know, we're having this podcast, no other animal, no bonobo is doing that right now, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, we're also so prone to error. We're so prone to bias. We're so prone to not appreciating what we have. And so, you know, the take that I, I bring to my students and, and that I talk about a lot on my podcast is this idea that our minds lie to us when it comes to happiness, right? We have these intuitions about the sorts of things that would make us happy. But in practice, a lot of those intuitions the research shows are wrong. And so I think, you know, the, the connection with the monkey work is recognizing how deep some of these errors go and that we might have errors when it comes to happiness as well. You teach at a school where there are so many driven students, right? There's students who are high achievers who have gotten into one of the most prestigious universities in the world. So you, in some ways you would think like, you've done it, you should be happy. But I know from listening to other interviews that you've done that one of the things that you really found was that your students were really unhappy, kind of profoundly so. Yeah, and I saw this, you know, in, in a really acute way in this new role that I took on on campus. So I've been teaching at Yale for now about 20 years, which makes me feel very old. But, you know, most of the time I was at, at teaching, I was, you know, at the front of the classroom, you know. So I saw students in the classroom and in my lab, but I didn't really get to know them really well. All that changed when I took on a new role at Yale where I became a head of college on campus. You know, so this is a role where I, I li physically live with students. Like my house is in a quad with students. I eat with them in the dining hall and so on. And that was where I got to see this college student mental health crisis up close and personal, you know, particularly acute at Yale because, as you've said, you know, Yale students, you know, these Ivy League kids that are incredibly driven and so on. But I think a shocking thing that I realized is that it's not just at Yale. In fact, there's lots of evidence that just nationally, students are really struggling. So nationally right now, college students report being uh, too depressed to function. They're overwhelmingly anxious. They're lonely. Um, and nationally right now, more than one in 10 students has seriously considered suicide in the last year. This is not just a couple snowflakes in the parlance of, you know, I think what the media talks about, right? This is a real national health crisis. And so I realized, you know, I really want to do something about this. Also, as educators, I think we're not really fulfilling our educational mission until we address this, right? Like students too depressed to function most days, like they're not 
learning whatever we're teaching them. If we're teaching them, you know, I don't know, Shakespeare or computer science, like they're not like retaining this just memory wise. They, their brains can't possibly pick up on this information if they're feeling so depressed and anxious. And so that was kind of more the origin story was to realize we got to do something about this. You know, I think my field of psychology has a lot of answers for the kinds of things you can do to feel better, right? Things you can do to not feel so stressed and depressed and anxious. And so I said, well, let me develop a whole class where I teach students all these strategies. Let me kind of give them, you know, the party line of what my field says about things you can do to feel better and hope that they can put these things into practice themselves. I really want to talk about what those actual things are. But before we do that, I I do feel like it's maybe an important caveat to put on and something that I'm curious to hear what you think about, because I know you've thought about this really deeply, that When we're talking about college students feeling too depressed to function, when we're talking about one in 10 students in the classroom, you know, thinking about suicide, having self-harm thoughts, how do you walk the line between the science of happiness and trying to get that out to people and not making people feel bad that they're not already happy? Which I, to be clear, I don't think you do, but I think a lot of the, like, you should just be happy framework that's out in the the world sometimes does that is like this toxic positivity side. So how do you personally think about like walking that line? Yeah, no, toxic positivity, you know, is is real and I think it, it honestly, I think it stems from yet another myth that we have about happiness, right? Which is that a good life means being happy all the time, right? If I'm feeling sad or frustrated or angry or, you know, anxious or whatever, I've done something wrong, right? And I need to fix it. And I think this is a myth, right? You know, em- emotions are these signals that are telling our body, you know, what we should be doing in the future and how we should behave in the future. And negative emotions are an incredibly important signal, right? Your sadness is telling you that there's something amiss. Your loneliness is telling you that you might need to seek out social connection. Your anger is telling you that something is wrong. You know, there's an injustice out there that you need to fix. And so I think this idea that, you know, we need to be happy all the time would just be psychologically and and evolutionarily would be terrible for us, right? Like we'd be missing out on these signals that tell us what we need. And so I think what we we need to do and what I preach a lot in the class isn't, you know, happiness isn't about being happy all the time. It's kind of having the normative emotions that come up based on situations. This is one of the things that I admire most about your work and I think is so interesting is that you really are rigorously grounded in the science and in the practical pieces that make a difference. I mean, one thing that really stands out to me is that when your course was offered as a free online class, they were able to measure significant increases in well-being scores. So this isn't just like, you know, hey, look at the sun and say, I'm happy. And then all of a sudden you feel happy. This is like real practice. I, I'm a scientist first and foremost. And, you know, I want to help people, but I also want to make sure that we're not selling snake oil. And, you know, as you said, there's a lot of snake oil out there, right? You know, from the toxic positivity to the woo stuff, right? There's just a lot of advice out there that that isn't necessarily scientifically rigorous, although it pretends that it is, or at least it's kind of scientifically adjacent. If I say, hey, you know, experience more gratitude or look at the sun or whatever the recommendation is, I'm saying, and here's the paper that shows that it might work for you. And if possible, Mm. trying to test it ourselves to make sure, you know, hey, if we you know, suggest these strategies to students, if the students actually put these things into practice, will we move the needle? And I think that's a hard test, right? I mean, you know, there's behavior change is really hard. And I think there's a lot of factors that affect our happiness. Um, You know, so if a simple, you know, 10 minute practice that I'm suggesting to students is moving the needle, realistically, it's probably not going to move the needle that much. Like if all of a sudden, you know, my students go from zero on a happiness scale to 100, you know, probably something's wrong. But the cool thing is that we actually do see small but significant increases in happiness, small but consistent increases in people's self-reported happiness. And and that's really cool. It suggests that some of the practices that we're suggesting really can work. So let's let's talk about it then. What are, what are some of these practices that you would recommend? You know, if you survey people, you know, again, around the new year, like when we're having this conversation, there's a lot of goals out there that people think are going to make them happy. You know, right now, or at least if you look at statistically last year in 2022, people's top New Year's resolutions were um lose weight. Like, you know, around four out of 10 people basically said they want to lose weight. Absolutely no evidence that losing weight is going to make you happier. Changing your body in general, probably not going to make you happier. Um, What really does make us happier, though, is changing other behaviors. Um, For example, increasing our social connection, a huge, Mm. huge boost in people's happiness. Pretty much every available study of happy people suggests that happy people are more social. And there's also evidence that getting more social will increase your happiness no matter your personality profile. So even if you are a self-reported introvert, 
um, getting some social connection will make you feel better. Again, not like huge parties, huge crowds, but just like, you know, contacting that person one-on-one that you care about but you haven't been in touch with in a while. Another big boost for our happiness is kind of getting away from this idea of self-care. Um, you know, these days we hear a lot about treating ourselves. And I think, you know, sometimes self-care can be like, you know, buy this bubble bath. But sometimes it's really about, you know, me time and me, me, me. But if you look at happy people, they're not as self-focused. They tend to be really other-oriented. Um, happy people on average controlled for income donate more money to charity. Happy people on average controlled for free time spend more of their time volunteering. They're kind of just like doing stuff to make other people happy rather than focused on their own happiness. And so there's evidence that if you just kind of do more stuff for other people, get kind of out of your own headspace and try to help others, it can actually boost your happiness. So those are just some behaviors that help with happiness. Um, there are also lots of mindsets that we can shift into that can really help with our happiness. For example, a mindset of gratitude, this idea of just counting your blessings, like taking moments to notice the good things in life. Sounds super cheesy, you know, sounds like grandmotherly wisdom, but I always say it might be common wisdom, but it's not common practice. Like common mm. practice these days is to complain about everything, right? Um, but again, there's evidence even if you just like you know, write down a few things that you're grateful for every night. You know, you can show significant increases in your happiness in as little as two weeks. And a, a final practice I'll, I'll mention is sort of this mindset of being a little bit more present, right? You know, we talk, you know, people have heard about mindfulness and being in the present moment, but but the evidence really suggests that, like, if you're just there with whatever's going on, noticing it, paying attention to it, and allowing it, that's better. And that includes being present when things like suck. Like that includes being present when you're feeling frustrated, when you're feeling really sad, when you're feeling overwhelmed. The start of the new year where you're like, oh, there's always things I didn't finish last year. There's so much on my plate. Like that's a moment to say, hey, wait, let me notice for a second. That's that's overwhelm, right? That's that's feeling like I haven't had a break. And that's not a nice thing to notice and feel. It's much better to like you know, pretend that that's not happening or cover it up or check your email or whatever. But the act of noticing that, it turns out, is important. It ultimately winds up making us feel happier, in part because it causes us, when you notice it, you got to deal with it and allow it and change it, perhaps, in some cases. So this act of being present is important, but it's not just being present when everything's like unicorns and rainbows. It's also being present when things don't feel so good. It's interesting because that that does seem to tie back to what you were saying before about the toxic positivity pieces, right? Like if you insist on everything has to be happy and good all the time, you can't actually be present when you're not feeling happy and good. And that paradoxically leads you to feel less happy and good. It prevents us from really taking action on the things that that matter, right? Um, no, really noticing like, oh, this is loneliness. And oh, hey, I can do something about loneliness. I can reach out to somebody. I can do something different. Or I'm feeling really overwhelmed. Like, actually, that means you need some rest. <laughs> you need to take some mm. things off your plate. And so I think we can't like see the solution that's going to help us most unless we know what the problem we're dealing with is. And, and knowing that problem requires understanding what emotion we're experiencing at any given time. Something that I often think of as kind of my personal goal for happiness is to if i'm if i imagine myself in this metaphor as i'm a cup to to be overflowing with so much that i can fill other people's cups sometimes i associate the idea of like volunteering and charity with like oh there's i'm overflowing so there's plenty to give and that's when that happens but it sounds like you're actually saying that that can also help fill my own cup, which I know I'm pushing this metaphor to its very limit here. But I no, wonder I if that is that true. I think that's totally right. I mean, I think another misconception that comes up when we think about happiness and motivation and things is this idea that, you know, if I do something nice for others, it kind of like depletes me, right? There's this kind of fixed happiness pie out there, right? And if I kind of give some of happiness to someone else, I'm kind of losing mm. out myself. But that's just simply not what the data suggests. How, like the nice stuff in the world and happiness this isn't a zero-sum game. Like, we're actually increasing the pie. So you're kind of, to use your cup metaphor, I guess, making the cup even bigger. <laughs> like, you kind of add parts <laughs> a larger, to the cup. Larger, you know, cup larger and larger second. cup, yeah, <laughs> um, by doing nice stuff for others, yeah. Um, which, again, totally, I mean, it's absolutely not what our intuition is. It's not what my intuition is. I mean, I know the data, I can cite the studies on this stuff showing, you know, people, again, people who do nice things for others tend to be happier. If I force you to do nice things for other people rather than do nice things for yourself, that will over time make you happier. Just like the simple act of forcing people to give some money to charity makes them feel better, right? Um, but that's not my intuition myself, especially when I'm having a bad day. My instinct is not, hey, let me do something nice for my brother or let me like give a gift to a coworker or something. It's, it's me, me, me. It's like, I want this stuff. But in fact, I know from the data that if you 
um, really do something nice for somebody else, you'll wind up feeling better. So yeah, we're increasing the cup size as we go. How much of happiness or more broadly well-being is adding positives and how much is removing negatives? It's definitely a little bit of both, right? I think you know, things like adding social connection, you know, you could construe as adding some positives in, right? I'm, I'm getting the boost of the social connection, but it's also decreasing your alone time, right? It's also getting rid of loneliness to a certain extent. A- another big factor for happiness that we haven't talked about yet is um, giving yourself a little bit more free time. Um, there's lots of evidence for the power of what's called time affluence, this subjective sense that you have some free time. And for most of us kind of feeling more time affluent means taking some stuff off our plate, right? Like taking stuff out of the calendar rather than adding to it. And so I think we we sometimes often forget that like happiness requires taking stuff away, but definitely when it comes to boosting our time affluence, there's a lot of spots where we need to take some stuff away to get more bandwidth to even think. It's interesting. I feel like for myself, one of the things that is often a a trap for me to to feel less happy is, um, being too focused on on money or income, um, just especially because I have irregular income, so it causes a lot of stress as to be like, well, is this actually going to last? How long is it going to last for? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but sometimes then when I look at my actual day and I think like, what would I do if I won the lottery? I, I've several times will have a day where I'm like, this is probably pretty close to what I would do, right? Like, I don't think I would actually like fly to some exotic locale. I'd probably like see some friends and have a great conversation with someone and you know, that might be closer to what it is. And I feel like that time affluence is always one of those moments where I think like, huh, I want to make a lot more money so that I can do exactly what I'm doing now, but not worry while I'm doing that right now is a strange loop that breaks me out of that cycle a little bit sometimes. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, this this is some lovely work by the Harvard Business School professor, Ashley Willens, that shows exactly this, that, you know, often when we think about getting more time, we're often thinking about, well, I'd have to give up money to do that. But what she finds is that people who focus on being wealthy in money aren't as happy as people who focus on being wealthy in time. And in fact, even Mm. spending your money to get back more time, you know, if you have, if you are lucky enough to have some discretionary income, spending it to, you know, not have to clean your house or even in some cases like you know buying takeouts you you know save time you know cooking and things like that spending your money that way and really framing it that way which is which is a, a spot where we mess up you know a lot of us might go to a restaurant but we don't sit in the restaurant and think look at how much time I'm saving. I don't have to go to the grocery store. I don't have to clean the dishes. We're not framing it in terms of the time saved. But the act of doing that can really make you happier, much happier than than money can make you. On the money and happiness point, it's worth saying money does make you happy if you don't have much of it, right? Like if you can't put food on the table, if you can't put a roof over your head, like it it really will make you much happier to get some money, you know? So it's not that money doesn't matter for happiness. It's that for probably a lot of the people listening to this podcast, if you have the basics in life, getting more money isn't really going to help. And so it's it's really, in in the U.S. right now, that's at around 75K, some estimates put it at. This is work by um, Danny Kahneman and Angus Deaton find around 75K that's probably the upper limit of like if you were to double or triple your income, wouldn't matter very much. Um, you know, so if you're like lower than that, more money will make you happy. Probably not as happy as you think, but a little more might help. After that point, more is just it's just kind of gravy. It's not really going to help as much as you assume. When you're in a situation, obviously, where the basics are hard to come by, so much of life is is requires a lot of mental energy. It also requires a lot of there's a lot of instability where you're not really sure things aren't predictable. Are we actually happier when we know like this is just reliable? Like I know for sure my rent is covered. I know for sure I I'm going to be able to go to the grocery store. Like those are kinds of predictability that I just intuitively, they seem like they must be really important for happiness. It honestly kind of depends. I think, you know, the, the predictability of the obvious things in life, you know, if you, if you if there's a really important thing like food on the table that you're not sure you're going to get, that feeling that anxiety is real. Like that anxiety is a true signal of like, man, if we don't do something different, we might get, not get food on the table. So it's that those negative emotions are honest signals that are telling you, hey, a, a really important thing kind of matters. You know, we sometimes forget, you know, that back in the day, this you know, Maslow had this idea of a hierarchy of needs. And at the bottom, it's like food, shelter, you know, whatever. Sometimes in our discussion of happiness, we can forget like, no, 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 those basics are still basic. Like those are still really essential. If you're unsure of them, it's going to be, you know, a bad scene. Um, 
But once we get them, then there's a question of like, okay, what else kind of has to be stable in life? What else has to be uncertain? And I think obviously novelty is kind of interesting, um, but that's in part because we get used to the things we have, right? And so one way to, to get back the novelty is to find ways to reframe the stuff you have as kind of being interesting again. It's sort of getting off what's often known as the hedonic treadmill, which is this idea that, you know, if you're on a treadmill for a long time, if you're running, you can kind of, you can sort of get used to it. You get used to the pace, you know, such that when you get off it, you're like, whoa, the, you know, like it feels like the world's not moving anymore, right? This is a, a treadmill that we can get on with all our, the rewards that we experience in life, all the good things in life. Um, it's one of the reasons that gratitude can be so powerful is that gratitude can get you to notice the stuff that you already have. And so, yeah, it's true that it feels like novelty will help us feel better, you know, a new phone, you know, a new trip or a new whatever. But often it's because we we have stopped experiencing the benefits of the things we already have. So if we can use strategies to re-experience the benefits of the stuff we have already, then we don't have to buy anything. Then we don't have to make any changes. We just kind of get the same happiness benefit over time for the stuff that we we have now. So this this is coming out in the new year. I wonder... What does the scientific research around well-being and happiness say about New Year's resolutions and about the way that we actually should approach a new year? Which, obviously, I feel like every scientist I know is feels <laughs> very strongly that, like, January 1st is just a day. It's truly just one more day. But for a lot of people, it doesn't feel like that. There's some evidence that it's worth sort of striking when the iron is hot, when the sort of motivation iron is hot. Um, okay. And there is evidence for for what researchers call the fresh start effect. This is some lovely work by uh, Katie Milkman um, at the University of Pennsylvania. And what, sh- what she finds is that our motivation like can kind of kick into high gear at certain temporal moments, right? New Year's is obviously one of them, but we have other ones like our birthday is often a time where we're like this year, you know, new switch, right? There are these kind of the moments that should be arbitrary, right? January 1st is just another day. But for some reason, it feels like, you know, we're, we're turning a new page, right? A new page on the calendar, blank slate, like anything is possible. And she finds that, like, those things matter, right? They can actually be moments where our, because our motivation is in high gear, it makes sense that we're ready to make some changes. I think the problem, though, with this fresh start effect is that we apply it to the wrong changes. We're like, this is the year that I'm going to lose a bunch of weight, which, like, again, you know, is in t- at least in terms of your happiness, like the evidence suggests is not just not going to work, right? Like, this is the year that I'm going to make more money at work or really double down on my career, Right. When if you took the fresh start moment and said, you know, this is the year that I'm really going to invest in social connection. This is the year that I'm really going to try to talk to myself in a different way. So I'm a little bit more self-compassionate. This is the year where I'm really going to focus on the things I'm grateful for and just try not to pay as much attention to the negativity and the hassles. Then the fresh start effect, you'd kind of apply this moment where motivation was feeling so amped up. You'd kind of apply that motivation in positive ways that would really have a true effect on our happiness. So I think it's not so much that New Year's resolutions are bad. I think, yeah, you know, any any day you're feeling motivated to go for it, you know, you should go for it and make changes. The problem is that we pick the wrong changes. And I think we also go about those changes with the wrong attitude. Um, we sometimes talk to ourselves, especially I think in the new year, in this sort of drill instructor mindset where it's like, well, if I just scream at myself and berate myself for how crappy things were last year, you know, I'll make it all better this year. And there's so much evidence to suggest that that simply doesn't work, that we'd, we'd do better if we took baby steps, if we engaged with these goals with a little bit more self-compassion, you know, like kind of thinking about not in terms of perfection, but in terms of kind of getting better slowly over time. You know, so we we need to pick different resolutions and we need to go about them a little bit differently. I've heard you talk before about uh, this term mind hitches. Um, can you tell us about what that is? Yeah, I mean, this is the idea that like, you know, our mind kind of sometimes messes us up, right? I think the problem with happiness isn't that we're not working towards it. I think most of us are putting in a lot of effort to feel better. Um, but the problem is that we seem to be doing it wrong. Like we we tend to go about the wrong goals. Um, and so I think understanding these biases, these spots where our minds go astray can actually be really helpful. Um, it's worth noting that they don't fix things completely. Like I still have pretty much all the wrong intuitions when it comes to happiness about like my social connection and and what I need and what circumstances will make me happy. I have the same bad intuitions as everybody else. But I think if you know that your mind is leading you astray, you can start doing better. You say you're you're not so good at this yourself. Oh, I what are some of terribly, the things, what, are, like well, tell, what are the things that you struggle with? Like oh, what, my, when you like, personally see it, like literally like, oh, everything. I'm not doing my own research. I mean okay. literally I mean, you know, like having a tough afternoon, right? You know, today I have a bunch of podcast interviews, a bunch of meetings. I know around five o'clock it's gonna be one of those days where I'm feeling tired. 
And my instinct is going to be like, I'm going to plop down and watch the next new Netflix show and like not get up, not talk to anyone, probably, you know, eat a bunch of junk food. Like that's what my brain is like, do this and everything will feel better. And I know that actually if I like called a friend or if I did a hard Pilates workout or if I just took a walk and or meditated, all of those things would feel way better than, you know, plopping down and watching Netflix and, you know, eating a bunch of junk food. But like, Mm. again, it's hard it's hard to remember that in the moment. It's hard to really do it. Do you have friends or family members or people in your life who, when they see you doing these other things, are like, uh, 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 I have a scientist who I know would say you shouldn't be doing that right now. Oh, I have a whole residential college of 400 students. Who do, <laughs> plus, and, and all the students walking around on campus who've taken my class who are very happy to tell me this. And, and that is, you know, in the moment a little bit like harsh and a little called out, but in practice, it's really helpful, right? Because mm. it means I have to practice what I preach, right? There's, there's, you know, people hear me talking about this stuff. Um, and so they'll definitely call me out. My my lovely producer and my co-writer, Ryan Dilly, is also really great with this. Um, you know, if I'm complaining about something, he'll often like mention like, I heard a podcast episode about gratitude <laughs> or I, I heard a podcast episode about being one with your negative emotions. I don't know where I heard that. And it's like, oh, okay. So it's, you know, in the moment it feels called out, but it's like, oh yeah, like we all need help with this because our intuitions are, are bad. So I believe you. And I also believe the science and the research is correct about these things. But I do feel at least inside of myself, this like instinctive desire to push back when you say like, I've had a long day instead of watching my favorite Netflix show, I should do a hard Pilates workout. Like what are the things that people push back on the most? Because um, I yeah. feel like that might be one of them. Yeah. And again, to be fair, it, it depends on what you need, right? You have to figure out what's going to work for you in those moments um, and, and pay attention really to like kind of how it's feeling. Um, in terms of some of the stuff where people push back a lot, you know, especially with my you know, type A Yale students, I get a lot of pushback when it comes to the work on money. Um, you know, a lot of them have, you know, worked incredibly hard in high school to get into a place like Yale so they can leave and get, you know, a job in finance or where they're going to make a lot of money. And I'm telling them like, nope, that's not going to work. After I present the work saying, you know, after 75K, you're not going to, you know, feel better. They're like, well, what if I invest it different? Or what if I, you know, like, really, you know, they really don't like that. Um, get a lot of pushback, you know, honestly, when it comes to this idea of negative emotions, right? That, that like we should allow and be one with our sadness, with our anxiety. I think that can feel really scary to people. How can I even overcome these emotions? So that's a spot where I get, you know, lots of pushback. And then also just this idea of, you know, is this the right enterprise? I mean, I think in the midst of you know, where we've been with the COVID-19 crisis, with anti-Black violence, with political polarization, with the climate being on fire, it can feel weird to focus on our happiness. I think people are like, is that just like really selfish or kind of Pollyanna-ish, right? Like, I'm just going to pretend that I'm happy when the whole world is messed up. And I think that's a spot where there are really interesting empirical data to push back. Because what the data suggests is if you really want to fight for social justice, if you want to take action against climate change, you might actually want to focus on your happiness. Because if you look at who's doing the push for these kinds of things, it tends to be people who are happier. It's like you got to put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others or helping the world. But we forget that our mental health kind of matters for our ability to do good stuff in the world and also for our performance. So that's another spot where I get pushed back is like, does this stuff really matter, you know, beyond just kind of selfishly feeling good? And it's like, yeah, I actually think we'll solve a lot more of the crises in the world if a lot of us were feeling better. You don't have to wait till you're perfectly happy because giving your life meaning by working towards stuff will actually make you happier in the long run. It sometimes doesn't. I think we sometimes forget that, too. Totally. I think the key is, again, you know, how much we're pushing and how we're doing and not noticing, you know, and this is something that, you know, I can speak to from my own experience. I'm actually taking a year off this year to kind of address my own sense of burnout. Um, you know, I was, you know, in the trenches working with students in the midst of COVID-19, fighting for all this stuff, and was starting to notice all the classic signs of burnout, things like that you're just really exhausted all the time and even getting a great night's sleep doesn't make you feel less exhausted. Um, things like cynicism, where, you know, like simple questions that my students had really like irk me a little bit more than they should have and a little bit more than mm. they would have if I was feeling a little bit better. Focusing on happiness, helping my students, it's given me tremendous purpose and meaning in life. But that doesn't mean you can pull back and stop paying attention to when the balance is a little bit off. And if you find that it's a little off, that is definitely a negative emotional signal that you should pay attention to because there's lots of evidence that if you don't, you know, then you're in for a 
full-blown burnout, and, and that, doesn't, that doesn't go very well after that. One topic that I, I would like to get a little deeper into, because you brought it up and brought up in, in relation to your own life, is how COVID-19 and the pandemic and the shifts that have happened in the world over the last couple of years, how those have changed the way that you think about happiness and well-being. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if anything, they've made me realize how important they are and, and how fragile um, some of the things that we need for our happiness really are. I mean, if you designed a disease that would hit at some of the things we fundamentally need for happiness, like COVID-19 would be it, right? You know, it, like it really made it so difficult to engage in social connection, right? It was like this uncertain thing that's still kind of uncertain. Is it here? Is it not here? How long is it going, right? These are all things that, you know, the human mind doesn't deal with well. We faced it in, out of nowhere, like in the middle of you know, a time when we were also experiencing political polarization, which makes us feel uncertain and, and allows us to feel a lack of social connection. We experienced it at a time of climate anxiety, which is a normative anxiety to have. It should be scary that the planet is getting hotter and hotter, right? And so I think, you know, it, it means all the more that we need to start focusing on our mental health, um, in part because, you know, there's things chipping away at it, right? So we need strategies to kind of do better. But also, as I said, like, these are threats that are real that I hope someone, especially my young, smart students, will be able to solve. And unless they're protecting their mental health, they simply won't have the emotional bandwidth to fix any of this stuff either. If someone's listening to this and they want to immediately, like, this podcast ends, they, they start a practice right now. Like, what's something that they should do in this moment as soon as the show ends to make themselves a tiny bit happier? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, honestly, the social connection piece is powerful. I think if when this podcast ends, you pick up your phone and you try to text a friend or call a friend or set up a time to, like, engage with another real human being in real life, you know, that's a positive thing you can do. And I promise that once you actually engage in that, at the end, if you, again, play scientist yourself and take your own data and figure out, like, how am I feeling, you'll feel, oh, I feel much better. I bet you, you know, you'll feel relatively better relative to maybe what you could have done with that half hour, which is like, you know, scrolling scrolling through your social media feed or something like that. Hmm. Um, that would be the biggest, fastest takeaway. Um, but I think, you know, all of, these, all of these practices we've talked about, it's worth noting that, like, they're kind of fast. Figuring out time to text a friend, you know, I best that I'll take half hour. You know, doing something nice for someone, you know, texting someone and checking in about how they're doing or doing a quick, you know, $5 donation to charity if you're having a bad day. Um, you know, doing something to feel a little bit more present. You know, that could be like a five-minute meditation or just like three conscious breaths of where you are right now in terms of your emotions. You know, scribbling in a gratitude journal, that'll take you like five minutes, right? I mean, all the things we're talking about don't have to be these mega investments. And I think recognizing that, realizing that these tiny baby steps can have big effects is also a way forward to realize you don't have to, you know, revamp the whole wheel. Like your fresh start doesn't have to be a, like, you know, tearing off the new page and like throwing out the rest of the book. You can really just be these small changes um, that you do intentionally and ideally turn into a habit over time that can have a big impact on how you're feeling. Well, Larry Santos, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sure that anyone who's listening to this podcast is going to immediately go and listen to the Happiness Lab, your podcast, to get even more from you. Um, but really, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for making the time. Thanks so much for having me on the show.